the way I've been ending all of these conversations that I've been having with people about this is that Trump is it, Trump is a is a terrible politician. Trump is 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 on his way out. Obviously, if I mean if not on his way to jail. I mean, <laughs> given what. Crossed. <laughs> but uh, but Trumpism is 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 here to stay. So by Trumpism, I mean everything that I've been writing about since What's the Matter with Kansas. This mm-hmm. kind of fake mm-hmm. uh, workerism, the, the the fake the the you know proletarian fraud that you see from the Republican Party. They are very very good at it. And here's the deal: others are better at it than Trump is. Trump is is fully incompetent. But if you had if you had a Marco Rubio in the White House or you had a Ted Cruz in the in the White House, they would not be screwing this up. If no. you had a you know no. uh, uh, Josh Hawley in the White House, they would not be screwing this up the way Trump did the last couple of years. And uh, th- that's I mean that's the future, and it's scary. And our our you know what have we got against that? Well, we've got uh, you know these 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 nice centrist Democrats who uh, you know they got a nice career, they got a nice life, they like being the party of Wall Street. It's a nice thing to be. They can. Uh, uh, you know, they they do a lot better now than they used to do. You look at Democrats. Of, you, another story I like to tell when Harry Truman retired. Harry Truman's our last president that didn't go to college. Mm. And when he was done being president in whatever that was, 1953, he went back to uh, Kansas City. He was from Independence, Missouri. It's a suburb of Kansas City. God, everyone's and, from Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, so he, he goes back there and and, uh, and, and he doesn't have a house he goes back and and moves in with his mother-in-law his wife's mom because that's <laughs> that's what he that's where he lived before he went oh. to Washington and the reporters were standing outside his house and he came out and they said well what did you do when you got home Mr. Truman he said well you know I carried the suitcases up to the attic <laughs> <laughs> and it's like that's his life and he they he he didn't um he didn't have a living he didn't have a a, a pension or anything this is when they had to finally give the president a pension because Truman had nothing and this is, but that's a, he was a Democrat. That's what that's what what the Democrats were. They were, you know, they were they they were not a party of wealthy people. They were, you know, they were a party of guys like that. And now they are the Clintons, who are, all, you know, like how, how what are the Clintons worth? Like five hundred million or something? I mean, yeah, they're, they're you know, and look at Obama's presidential library. It's going to get close to a billion dollars. You know, they're oh Truman's presidential library cost a little over one million dollars. Wow. If you ever go to Kansas City, you got to see it. It's the first of the official presidential libraries. It cost a little over a million dollars. Mm. And uh, uh, George Bush's, which is the most recent one, George W. Bush is like five hundred million you know there's all these donors from the uae and you know, mm-hmm. yeah. this kind of crap and the clinton library is this f- fantastic glass and steel structure out over the uh what is the river that runs through little rock and uh and and barack obama is building this ex- extraordinary thing in the south side of chicago but uh you know look at harry truman's it's just this modest little <laughs> it's a one story <laughs> anyhow the democrats don't nobody wants to be that party anymore right they like being the party of Wall Street. They like being the party of Silicon Valley. It, you know, they like being competitive with the Republicans in this. And that's what we've got, you know, to stand up against, uh, against these people who will stop at nothing. Yeah. And that's a depressing thought. But I'm a depressing guy. <laughs> well, look, we, we've had a couple of, you know, labor leaders and stuff on here that have kind of traced out some kind well, what, of path. So, Brianna, let me turn it around. What should we, what is the answer to your question? What is the positive thought? Well, it's not so much that I'm looking for a positive thought. It's a plan of action for how to get past this. So what are the conditions that make a a kind of third party insurgency or populist insurgency ripe for success? Even even if success is defined by disrupting the duopoly so that at least one of the parties is more responsive again. You know, what, what was it, you know, you talked about um, when I asked you if FDR, you know, how FDR was able to get past the overwhelming media bias, you pointed to the fact of labor involvement. But of course, yeah, and also it radio. Was through... he could, radio. He could talk directly to the public. OK, but it's also th- only through FDR and his labor active, you know, his, his labor support that we had the kind of tripling of labor participation that then became a powerhouse for the Democratic Party from that point forward. So I'm just, I'm curious because they're, they're, you know, obviously he was able to do a lot before that happened, yeah. you know, before we had the 
peak of labor participation in the country, he was still able to. So was it just the purity of the message and the willingness to commit? Is it that he didn't have as much in the way of corporate opposition because he had a great deal, as you explained? I'm just trying to figure out well, you, we're you never going to out fundraise them. We're never going to out maneuver yes. them financially. Bernie Sanders also had a ton of money. Money wasn't his issue, right? At least it became that way eventually. Yeah. You know, Ralph Nader ran in 2000 and did this kind of, you know, tried this third party uh, uprising and it didn't work at all. And if anything, it, you know, it caused, you know, it, it caused terrible problems for, for the, you know, a lot of people blame Al Gore's defeat on on Ralph Nader. I don't think that's fair, not, but not this girl. <laughs> no, no, I know, but but that, that that's one model. And then and then Sanders had a different one. You know, Sanders could have gone that route, but he chose to work within the Democratic Party. Now, the Democratic Party admittedly really uh, treated Sanders unfairly. We all know that story. Uh, sure. you know, they were determined that he would not be the nominee and they would they would uh, uh, they they were willing to do almost anything to stop him. And they, you know, and they they did it and they stopped him. Um but uh, you look at the Trump campaign in in sixteen, where this is a guy who you know really was you know had flirted with a third party run before, uh, was wasn't really that much of a Republican, uh, you know the tra- you know uh, free trade was uh, sacred to these guys, and he trashed it. You know he came in and just trashed it, and uh, and also at the same time remember uh, promised that he would never cut Social Security, and they uh, mm-hmm. uh, and and he wailed on him, uh, and. Uh, so the problem with his model, with that, I mean, that's and we, I, I loved seeing what he did to the Republican Party. He just completely destroyed that uh, the organization. I loved that, but he's a billionaire. He has resources to burn. None of us have that, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. So the only alternative is to is to build something, uh, you know. So I think you have to, when you look at the different models, it has to be within the party, but it also has to be, you know, in in the sort of in the Bernie Sanders vein. But it, there has to be some. Uh, strong base of support. One of the things I really like about Bernie is that he understands this, I think, uniquely among American politicians now, is that it's not just about the individual leader, that it's about building a movement. And, uh, okay, let's end this on a happy note. There's going to be another Bernie. You know, I don't know who it's going to be, but there is going to be uh, another one. This movement is not going to stop with him uh, you know, retiring or whatever it is that he's that he has planned for his future. There's going to be somebody else is going to take, you know, is going to take this thing up, and I it, it's got to continue to build. Um, and uh, I have uh, I have high hopes for that. I think that look ultimately when um, voters are faced with a choice between this kind of crazy fake workerist. Uh, you know, ideology of the right, this sort of culture war resentment, which I admit is very attractive and some kind of real deal, they will, you know, universal health care, they will always choose the real deal. I, I sincerely believe that. I have to believe that. Does that does that please yeah. you, Brianna? I mean, you know, we obviously have the counterexample of 2020. Unfortunately. Oh, come on! You just keep you keep, you keep checkmating me. Would you stop it? Well, well, no. It's just that I I think that I don't think it's impossible, but I do think we have to be kind of clear-eyed about the fact that something has to change. We can't just keep repeating 2016 and then 2020. And you know, there are some people who will say. Well, we need more organizing, and that's true. But also, uh, there, absolutely true. Yes, there are some barriers to getting organized labor in a place where they can then be relied on for blocks of support because of the fact that Republicans in office who have done so much to destroy labor rights yep. and Democrats in office who aren't particularly yeah, who won't won't lift a that. finger exactly right. So it's we're in this a little bit of like a catch twenty two, and I think that we should be clear out about that, but also recognize that it might take something more radical to get us out of it than anything that we've ever seen before. Well, there you put your finger on something really interesting because someone like Biden and Obama used to always say how pro-union they were and how pro-organizing they were, and then they never did anything. Do you remember when Obama was president, he talked so many times about, uh, what was it called, Uh, the the, uh, EFCA, uh, Employee Free Choice Act, and then did nothing, Uh, didn't lift a finger as it went Mm -hmm. down. And uh, 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 Biden has made the same noises many times. 
Well, you mentioned earlier how we're in this unusual situation where, you know, one or two people can cause real headaches for the Democratic leadership now. Well, maybe this is an issue to go to the wall on, especially since Biden says he's in favor of it. They Mm -hmm. all, I mean, Democrats routinely still, you know, uh, mouth this language of being pro-labor. Well, prove it. Make it, you know, give us card check, make it easier to, to, to form a union in this country. Once that, look, I still believe once that happens, you you could see a kind of organizing wave like the 1930s that could yeah. happen again. Uh, and once that does, then you, you know, you know, then uh, all the bets are off. Everything could change. But I don't know, Brianna. I don't know, Virgil. I look at what happened today. I think we hit some kind of crazy turning point today. And I don't know what's going to happen in this country. Uh, there's... Well, you know- you know that's you know that's really the other concern is that you can if you, if you are a democratic centrist you can use the specter of right wing violence as another way of saying to people well you don't have a choice because you have to you have to put us in charge because we're the only ones who can keep this kind of shit at bay and kind of maintain a sort of stability in this country yeah although i've i've never really understood that because i mean that argument because the centrists uh, don't have a particularly good track record, you know, at beating these guys. You know, they, 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 you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> historically, seriously, especially. Hillary Clinton, you know, John Kerry, you know, Dukakis, on and on and on. But, you know, um, I mean, I, I mean, Jimmy I, I guess I, I guess I don't want to end on a, on another pessimistic note. But, but by I, the way, people... whereas, whereas Franklin Roosevelt was like, he wailed on these people. Oh, like, he whipped yeah. their asses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Four times. And Harry Truman, a fifth. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't want to necessarily end on a pessimistic note, but I do see, I, you know, I do see people say things like this is, oh, this is 1968 for the Republicans. And, you know, they're they're screwed now. This is going to be a big problem for them. No, that, the wait, uh, wait and, Virgil, stop. People have been saying this every time something goes wrong for the people were saying this in after 08. Do you remember? And they what yeah. do they pull out of their sleeve? The Tea Party movement. They just dream this up. And, uh, and next thing you know, it's all over America, and they've captured it. It's the, almost the perfect example of the fake populism that I'm talking about. All of this anger out there in America, and they managed to put themselves at the head of it. They have no right to it. They're the ones that should be, you know, running from it. But instead, they make themselves the heroes. They're very so, good at this. I don't. They, so I. I don't see this particular man of this specific manifestation of the far right, this this fascist manifestation that we saw in the Capitol earlier today. I don't see that being a problem for Republicans. I see that taking over the Republican Party, that becoming the center of gravity, because as we know, 85 percent of Republicans believe that the election was stolen. They believe that the federal government is fundamentally illegitimate. This sort of thing doesn't hurt. Uh, it doesn't hurt Ted Cruz to violate the the li- norms and the liberal pieties. Like he can be scolded on Twitter and MSNBC all day. It's not going to matter to the actual people who are going to vote on this stuff. Yeah. And I would say I'm more confident today than I was yesterday that Republicans are going to win back both chambers of Congress in 2022. Wow, what a way to end this. Well, sorry, crap. Um, <laughs> okay, but like, what if we storm the gates, Virgil? Oh no, 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 no. no. I mean, that's what people are saying. Thomas Frank, this is going to be the copy on this episode. Thomas Frank said, Dr. Thomas Frank said, <laughs> the solution to right wing populism is that leftists need to storm the gate. No, the I'm not saying that, though. I'm not saying that. But I, but I do. I do always say I do always say that the that populism is not the problem. Populism is the solution. But populism is not what you saw in the streets today. That's that's crazy. That's like some kind of you know mob action. Populism is yeah. not mob rule. It is. It just isn't. That's a, that is a, 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 a you know a a, a a fever dream of right wing newspaper columnists in the eighteen nineties. That's not what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I think really the missing ingredient is a materialist understanding of our conditions. And that's why shit like this right wing violence, that's why this doesn't go anywhere, either either intellectually or in practice, because well, it does not actually it does not actually right. It does not actually reflect the, the material reality of our economy. It's it's but and it, that's, it and, is about the checks, right? Like the, at least as far as who was it that said in the interview? The person just some, just some random dunce who was there. But here's the thing. I, I, I don't know that I, and I don't want to keep drawing this out. I know everyone has to go. My groceries are downstairs in the lobby. But the, <laughs> the reality. Oh, no. oh, God. Oh, God, Bree. <laughs> it's dangerous out there. Be careful. Uh, it's just the lobby. But the, 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 the gag is, like, 
the, the these people are, are see Donald Trump. Donald Trump came out on the ninth inning as for the two thousand dollar checks. Joe Biden does not have the same identity with those checks and those kinds of material concerns. It was enough to pull him out in Georgia, but obviously this group of people was motivated in part by the idea that Donald Trump is the best shepherd for their material well-being. And so it really does feel like it's the vacuum. It's it's it Donald Trump has to do the bare minimum for there to be a vacuum of these people to run into because the Democratic Party is seen as offering so very little. Yeah, so maybe the answer is just more checks to more people. Yes, but Brianna, everything is scrambled now because of because of COVID. You know, we we've gone through a summer where everybody it felt like to me was going progressively insane. I mm-hmm. tried to I tried to write about this for a French newspaper. This feeling that it, all, you know all summer long it just got worse and worse and worse. And I would turn on Twitter every day, and everybody is yelling at everybody else. It's the war of all against all. Uh, it's absolutely crazy. And now this, what a way to end this! This 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 has to end. This has to end. We can't go on like this. This COVID, and this is obviously Biden has to come in and just. He has got to be, I mean, he has to rise to the occasion. He has to. He has to. 